So uh, welcome back, Steve Diver, to our uh, this is our third of four presentations on um, the sort of the structure of biological ag, the history, the outline. Um, you know, much coming from the acres community. I think um, <clears throat> the practices that are being applied on a lot of the leading uh, farms planet wide have sort of coalesced in this in this space, roughly referred to as biological ag, um, integrating organic and conventional and permaculture and biodynamic and agroecology and um, et cetera. So Steve, uh, you, you know, laid out the three pillars as I believe it was minerals, biology, and energy. And you did, um, you know, overlaid uh, sort of broad over overview in February. And then um, I'm not sure if it was March or April, you did uh, the minerals and now today it's biology. So All right, we're going to do biology today and uh, we're going to do the three pillars and then we'll do the energy uh, in June, I think. Right. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. So, so today is the sort of the broad framing of the biological leg of the stool and I'll just let you take it away from there. Okay. Okay. Good. Hey everybody. Uh, so glad to be back here. So we're continuing on with this theme, the three pillars of eco-agriculture, because it's been so really important and, and uh, instrumental in influencing how we're approaching uh, soil and nutrition, nutrient-dense crops, how to grow crops with fewer pestis, uh, pests and using fewer pesticides because we're raising such healthy crops with good soil nutrition. So this is gonna be the one on biology and humus management. And so, um, Let's begin on that one. So like I said, uh, we're gonna do a quick introduction where we started off, which was um, all this started off 50 years ago with Charles Walters, who was an ag journalist and started the Acres USA magazine. And that was 50 years ago in June of, uh, of, uh, of 1971. And then uh, they've had the Eco Ag uh, Conference and Trade Show with all the seminars. That's been going on for 45 years. So. Like we said before, eco-agriculture, eco-farming, those terms were very popular back in the 1970s. And, and then things have evolved since then, but um, uh, you know, people are still interested in the same thing. And then we mentioned that it has the acres as a, as a conference and with the seminars and with the teachers was very influential on the eco-farm conference that's held in Asilomar, California the Bionutrient Food Association that Dan Kittredge is, is promoting, and then Advancing Eco-Agriculture, which is John Kemp's company. And so uh, then we also talked about how um, the theme is standing on the shoulders of giants. And so you have a series of pioneers and then a lot of, a lot of teachers and consultants who, who knew these pioneers personally and studied with them and then have carried on these this teaching on and, and, and improved on the system. You know, when we go to these conferences, everybody's learning, it's a two-way learning street. So uh, we talked about William Albrecht and Kerry Reams, um, and then a number of these different people. We'll talk about Phil Callahan and Bruce Tanio when the energy um, seminar comes up. But um, if you look through this, a, a lot of people here have emphasized soil biology and humus management all along. And then we came down to this theme, which is that organic versus conventional is a false dichotomy. And even though that's very popular in media and discussion groups for people to try to paint agriculture as one size fits all, there's really a lot of variation amongst farmers. And even in conventional farming, they're, they're not all the same. Even one single state has so many different soils and different climates, the way farmers do things. But we, and this theme of, of eco-agriculture and eco-farming has echoed through a number of alternative farming systems. The sustainable ag um, experience that has been really big with USDA, the Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Program, and, and now the NRCS has adopted soil health, organic agriculture, both the larger style of organic agriculture as well as certified organic production under the USDA NLP permaculture, nature farming in Japan, nature farming in Korea, nature farming in India, holistic grazing, and inter integrated crop production, biodynamic agriculture, and then this eco-agriculture. And really all of these 
uh, alternative farming systems, which are a lot of times have been generated and, and envisioned by pioneers, but have been farmer driven. All of these are really about local healthy foods and food systems and finding solutions to pest control that are non-toxic, least toxic, and then designing agroecosystems that mimic nature and take advantage of things like biodiversity and uh, the, the things that come out of that. And then here we get down to this big emphasis on creating a habitat for uh, uh, the soil organisms to thrive and create organic matter and humus in the soil, and then um, developing this healthy consortia of beneficial microorganisms. So that's the quick introduction. And then, so while Charles Walters, in his way of describing eco-agriculture, was talking about ecological and environmental or ecological type of agriculture, uh, in my way of putting it together, I've talked about the three pillars of eco-agriculture, and this is based on a lecture I did for Acres USA, and I, the way I broke this down was that the three pillars of eco-agriculture are minerals, biology, and energy. So, um, and this is just a way for, to frame it and that, to describe it. That's what the pioneers and the teachers have, have been emphasizing. This is a way that farmers can grasp things and and use and categorize. So we talked about minerals and soil testing and how paying attention to mineral balancing and foliar fertilization can lead to really healthy crops that are nutrient dense, provide a, a suite of minerals that are healthy for people and animals to consume. And then today we're going to talk about biology, which is really biology and humus management that includes composts, uh, compost teas, compost extracts, cover cropping systems, lots of different crop rotations, a lot of different holistic grazing systems, both no-till and proper tillage, and then a lot on microbial inoculants. And then, and then the next time we'll talk about energy. So that's today's uh, introduction. And so what I want to start with is this one slide on characteristics of a healthy soil and so you see a lot of things on there that, you know, just a few things to point out. So healthy soils, people, farmers talk about good soil tilth. It has, it's friable, it's easy to work. It's in good physical condition with soil organic matter. And there are a number of things on here. Uh, I just want to point out a couple uh, beneficial microorganisms, large population of diverse macro and microorganisms. And then stable soil structure, does the soil hold together when it rains or does it, does it fall apart? And then we come down to this. This is what I want to point out is that the new emerging uh, awareness around soil health is closely tied to soil biology. And there's this whole new and emerging awareness of uh, when you pull together these model agroecosystems and you create these um, cropping systems that mimic nature, you, and this is all being done by innovators and early adopters, you can, re, you can get to a point where you're, you're seeing remarkable paradigm shifting regenerative agriculture and Dr. Higa, who develops the EM effective microorganism system, talks about limit breakthroughs. And so he's talking about where normally a rice stalk would have 100 grains on it. They're seeing as many three or 400 grains of rice on one stalk. And, and the same thing, it just keeps on escalating. Like if you know one, one banana had banana stalk had two bunches then they're seeing banana stalks with 10 bunches. So this is the kind of breakthrough that people are really excited about. And so let's, let's wade into this and see what we got here. So we talked about agroecosystems, mimicking those. And this is what we're talking about. We're talking about, for example, the forest ecosystem, the prairie ecosystem, wetlands. And, and if you look at these, these natural plant ecosystems, they're a really complex association of both above ground plant species and below ground soil food web species. So 
You've got the forest. You can imagine the rich forest with ferns, mosses, a great variety of trees grown in there. The prairie. Prairies are great. There are um, hundreds of species of grasses, forbs, and legumes all growing together that evolved over like 10,000 years and incredible deep root systems that hold the soil together and build really great plant um, microbial communities and rich in humus. And so all of this is driven by soil food web. There's nobody fertilizing the forest and prairies and yet look how incredibly productive they are. The whole vast areas of grasslands in the United States and in Russia and, and, and other places and in the whole vast forest that cover the earth. And then another thing is that uh, you'll see a succession of a greater amount of fungal my, soil microbial co uh, communities that live in these systems. So let's look at a few things that I find very interesting and let's start with this one right here is what does all life on Earth, including humans, zebras, lichens, slime molds, jellyfish, flowers, bees, and soil microbes all have in common? And what they have in common is cells, cells being the foundation of life and some interesting character characteristics of these plant and animal cells, for example, are is the conversion of sunlight into carbon-based molecules by plants and microorganisms and their ability to manufacture millions of different life forms, including bacteria, algae, protists, fungi, plants, and animals. And even, for example, in the plant cytoplasm, there may be as over 200,000 carbon-based metabolites that are manufactured. And these, this, these cellular functions take place at warp speeds. They take place at nano, pico, and femtoseconds, which is one million to one quadrillionth of a second. And they take place in the micro nanosphere, which is one millionth to one billionth of a meter. The other thing is when we talk about unicellular uh, organisms or, or microorganisms like bacteria and yeast, um, is that cells are like little factories with administration, security, procurement, manufacturing, transportation, and waste management. So it's really helpful to think about cells that way because they are so productive. And inside one cell, you can have incredible numbers of these organelles and structures that are inside the cells. So you have RNA, over 2,000 DNA, over 5 million in a, in a bacterial cell. And then you have ribosomes, proteins, over 3 million proteins can live in one single bacterial cell and lipids. And then you see both this, you know, uh, quite a number there in a yeast cell. You see the dimensions of them. You're talking about uh, uh, bacterial cells are in the, like the one micrometer size. And then a yeast cell are a little bit bigger than that. Another thing that's important to realize is that every single bio biomolecule in nature, every plant and animal will eventually be decomposed by unicellular and multicellular microorganisms. And then th this is helpful just starting out is to get this concept of what size we're talking about. So here's a meter. You can have a small, you know, like a child about the size of a meter, a little, little more than a yard. A thousand times smaller than that is a millimeter. A thousand times smaller than that is a micrometer. So that is a million times smaller. And uh, that's the size of where your cell, uh, your bacterial and yeast cells are right around the, the, the one meter, one micrometer. And then a thousand times smaller than that, which is one billionth times smaller than, than a small child, is, is in the nanometer set scale. And that's what's inside the cell. And then atoms and so forth, smaller than that. You can see what you can see with the light microscope, what you can see with electron microscope. And then cells, let's talk about how they're composed. They're 70% composed of 70% water and 30% uh, substances like proteins, small molecules, RNA, DNA, lipids, polysaccharides. Now here's what's very interesting. We're talking about these cells as cellular factories. What's interesting is we're taking the conversion of CO2 from sunlight and from carbon from consumption of other organisms and create an incredible array of metabolites and compounds. So you see all these different uh, compounds that are produced inside a cell. 
And the ones that in red are really interesting, the amino acids, the enzymes, polysaccharides, organic acids, hormones, and vitamins. This is really key to understanding the importance of soil biology in agriculture. And then uh, you can find over 1,000 different kinds of enzymes in a bacterial cell. So here's, let's talk about this soil microbial world and put this in perspective. So everything once living will be consumed by microbial decomposers. And every kind of microbe occurs everywhere plants and animals exist. And every surface on the whole planet is a microbial habitat. So uh, then we talk about soil enzymes and how they influence soil health. Let's just look at a couple slides here on this. So an enzyme is a protein that is produced by these you know, microbial and plant cells that act as a catalyst. And you have different kinds of enzymes. You have intracellular, you have extracellular, et cetera. But look what they do. You, if you need to break down starch or sulfur or transform sulfur or glucose, cellulose, cellulose chitin, uh, phosphorus, proteins, et cetera, you have an enzyme. So you have thousands of these enzymes working to convert and transform all the time. So this is really important. And then also organic acids, um, they are really important in solubilization and mineralization, biological control, detoxification, chelation. You see a lot of those there, lactic acid, acetic acid, citric acid, oxalic acid, malic acid, and, and so on. So I wanna really just share this concept of how powerful cells are and um, how we can take advantage of them. So we're talking about soil uh, microbiology. So first we're gonna talk about soil microflora. And this is a category we're talking about bacteria, actinomycetes, algae, and fungi. Uh, all many thousands of, tens of thousands of species of these, of each, each group, different, different um, groups, different genera, multi-species within each genera. And they all have different functions. Um, we talk about um, the earthy smell, that's from actinomycetes. Uh, antibacterial, antifungal materials um, uh, come, antibiotics come from actinomycetes and so forth. Uh, then we have soil microflora, microfauna, and we have nematodes, protozoa, mites, springtails, and then we have soil macroorganisms. So we can see these with the naked eye. So that's what we're talking about. And then What's important is to talk about the classification of soil biota because we're going to look at how we can create a habitat and what what is the what is the nature of their their size and who's their where are they living? So microflora is in less than 10 micrometers. That includes all your bacteria, fungi, actinomycetes, and algae. And then microfauna is a little bigger, the protozoa and nematodes, and then the mites and springtails are bigger than that, and so forth. So these, all of this includes microflora decomposers, microfaunal grazers and predators, and shredders and ecosystem engineers. And so when we put all this together, this is really interesting because we're going to talk about soil structure and soil humus and how does this all fit together. So when you look at the, the primary soil minerals are clay, sand, silt, and clay, and you can see the size of them. So uh, sand's bigger, and then silt, and then clay is very small. So you can see that clay are in the same category and a little smaller than bacteria. And then you have different size uh, clusters of soil. You have both micro clusters and macro clusters. And then here's your bacteria, and here's your fungal hyphae. Here's the protozoa and nematodes. And then here's plant roots and plant hairs. And if you look at all that, you can kind of see how this is all happening in the micro universe, the nanosphere, the micro um, sphere and the nanosphere. We talked about how soil microorganisms live in association with plant roots and excrete sticky substances. This is a key concept. So we talked about how cells are producing enzymes, organic acids, polysaccharides. So these are different kinds of polysaccharides they produce and then they interact with the soil and hold it all together. So here's, here is, for example, here's some actinomycetes filaments. 
that are binding the pri primary soil particles, sand, silt, and clay. So here's the, here's like a clay particle, very tiny, and here's the, here's the microbial glue that is being exuded by actinomycetes, and they're holding the soil together that way, binding them all together. And here's fungal hyphae in meshing soil aggregates and bacterial colony on humus aggregates. So this is all, this is something that would not have been around, say, you know, 40 years ago, because this is all modern electron microscopy. And then here's the soil aggregation. This concept is really key and vital to understanding soil health is that you have both micro clusters or micro aggregates that are bound together in macro aggregates or macro clusters, and then they all form up. And you have bacteria, you have fungal hyphae growing through there, and that's the soil structure. So here's an example of an aggregate with micropores. Here's the binding forces, bacterial glues, humic polymers, cations, fungal hyphae, mycorrhizal glomalin, organic matter degree, polysaccharides, plant hairs, etc. And when we put it all together, that's what we are looking for is this good soil crumb structure that farmers say look like black cottage cheese. And when you go back, the USDA, because of the, you know, their work in protecting the soil over the years have put out some different um, bulletins and information leaflets. And there is an old concept in organic farming called soil depleting and soil building crops and rotations. And so that came out in the 1930s. And then in the 1950s, they talked about your soil, crumbly or clotty. And this really puts this in perspective. So here is a um, cornfield that's probably planted back in those days, probably planted on 36 inch rows and it was cultivated. And right on the edge of the fence line is the virgin prairie. So they took samples of those and then, and then put them with water. And this is what happens is they, the prairie soils hold together these water stable aggregates and you have really good infiltration of the water into the soil and the cultivated soil because it's lost its glues and its structure is dispersed and cause this puddling. And that's what we're talking about when we're talking about soil health and why it's so important. So here's an example. This is a modern NRCS view of, of soil health. So this is, um, this is the kind of situation you'll see where water is puddling on the field. And during a rainfall event, it puddles and does not infiltrate and starts running off. And when it starts running off, you get soil erosion. You have loss of soil, you have loss of nutrients. And this is the kind of demonstration people are doing not nowadays. So they've got a tilled cover crop, they poured some water in there and they had a fair amount of runoff in that, plus some sedimentation. They had a tarped cover crop. They had still had some runoff, but the, the sedimentation is less. And then they had, it has not been tilled in almost two years and it's mulched. And the water is actually infiltrated into this sub pan right there. The same thing, here's the edge of the field, the hedge row or the fence row, same thing. Lots of biodiversity and plant cover, lots of cover, and then the soil has infiltrated because they're getting that good effect. So what I wanna do here is we're talking about agroecosystems and how to mimic, how to model those and take advantage of nature. So I wanna do something with the next six slides. I wanna talk about some different principles. So we're gonna talk about the principle of microbial abundance and diversity and soil organic matter functioning, soil food web functioning, biological control mechanisms, the MIN concept, microbially enhanced nutrient delivery, and soil food web succession. So first, let's talk about microbial abundance and diversity, or also known as microbial, microbial density and diversity. And that principle says that it is the population abundance and complex diversity of soil microorganisms that drive soil functions. Microbial density and diversity. You want a lot more microbial biomass, and you want to have a great diversity of soil microbial biomass. They influence everything from soil structure to soil organic matter, soil humus formation, soil moisture retention, soil fertility, and disease suppression. Soil organic matter functioning is paying attention to the biological, physical, and chemical functions in the soil. And soil organic matter is at the heart of all three of those. And so there's many different things that are happening 
when you have better solar organic matter, we talked about the humus law where you need at least 3% organic matter for all this good functioning to occur naturally. And so just a lot of different things, slow release of nutrients in terms of biological functions, depression, suppression of diseases, good soil structure, aggregate stability, water holding capacity, and then enhancing the cation exchange capacity and buffering soil pH, that sort of thing. This one is really interesting because when all of the stuff I've talked here previously about the cell as a cellular factory, its production of enzymes and organic acids and polysaccharides, this is where it all comes together because this is soil food web functioning or soil microbial functioning that we talked about, the rhizosphere, the phylosphere, plant growth promoting rhizobacteria, symbiotic and saprophytic fungi, and all these different functions they do. This is just a short list, but these are the ecosystem services from a healthy soil um, biological community. So you have bacterial and fungal decomposers, nitrogen fixation, carbon fixation, transformation availability of nutrients, especially nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur, phosphorus solubilizing bacteria, biological control of diseases and insects, phytohormones and bioactive substances, organic acids, enzymes, and all these polysaccharides and glues. Then um, in terms of biological control, this is, a, this is what you're after. If, if you have a healthy consortia, a robust community of soil biology, has microbial density and diversity, this is what you're after, is these natural biological control mechanisms. And here's an example. This is, um, this is the control where they took, um, this is a petri dish with auger in it. This is a cotton ball. They put the disease organism here, the phytophthora. They, put, they treated these other cotton balls with water because there's no competition. The pathogen grows freely across the auger plate. However, this one has the phytophthora added here and all of these have been soaked in a warm compost extract, which has a rich consortia of microorganisms and they develop their own microbial sphere and that is called competitive exclusion. This is just a visual way to understand these biological control mechanisms. And that is what we're after with the way we manage soils and take advantage of these things. We talked about the MEND concept, microbially enhanced nutrient delivery, and it builds on the other principle we just talked about, microbial density and diversity in the rhizosphere and in the phytosphere. And the more, the higher the number, and the more diverse the number of microorganisms living here, the better the nutrient availability is. And that influences how far to do things like blending microbes, minerals, the way you do foliar fertigation, the way you inject in fertigation with drip irrigation. And when you put all that together, when you blend my, uh, biology with your fertility, you can reduce the fertility inputs. Um, this farmers see this all the time. They can see somewhere between 25 and 75% reduction. And then finally, this one, this is plant succession. Um, uh, what you see with um, above ground plant succession and a below ground soil food web succession. This one started with Elaine Ingham with Soil Food Web Inc. And then this has been modified by my work with Betsy Ross in Texas. And so what you're seeing is a microbial biomass. You have a certain amount of, of bacterial biomass and a certain amount of fungal biomass. And when you have an early si a succession site, you have more primitive plant species, it's, it's more highly dominated by bacterial species. You can think of this as a cup of a bacterial uh, biomass, or let's say a, a micro cup, a thimble full of, of bacterial bi biomass and, and fungal biomass. So uh, here with early grasses like um, KR blue stem, Bahia, you have a third of the cup is filled with fungal compared to bacterial. Then you get down to Bermuda grass in St. Augustine, um, uh, roughly 70% is filled with fungal. Then when you get to late cereal grasses, row crops and vegetables, you get up to about one to one or 1 1.5. So now they're equal and they're training more towards fungal. 
when you get into shrubs, vines, and actually native prairies, now you're going, you're definitely trending more fungal. And this was the key finding that we discovered in Texas through our work down there. We found that prairies, because of this long-term non-disturbance, incredible diversity of plants, and their interaction with the soil is they have, they create a more fungal environment. So this continues on with trees and coniferous forests and so forth. So over time, with in, as, as this plant system becomes increasingly more perennial, there's less disturbance. You have this deposition of mulch, you have greater fungal diversity, and you have greater amount of mycorrhizal fungal hyphae. So this is a real key to uh, understanding how to manage land, especially if you're doing pastures, uh, but all kinds of other crops. This is really helpful. This is like a roadmap. So now we, the first part was an introduction to soil biology and, and the principles and why it's so important. And now I'm gonna talk about some of the innovations that we've seen over the last uh, probably three decades. And the first one is a, a, a really one of the more re recent innovations, and that is the Johnson Sioux compost system. This is developed by David C. Johnson and his wife, and Sue. And then that's, he started this at uh, New Mexico State University. This is kind of an ecosystem compost. And so this, uh, uh, many people are doing this now. You get a pallet, put some holes in there with some fabric weed barrier. You get some uh, wire mesh, you uh, put some of this weed berry in there and you fill it up with your substances, your leaves and chips and whatever. A lot of people doing this like a veganic style compost that doesn't even have any kind of animal manure in it or food waste. It's just a lot of leaves and wood chips and straw. You make these PVC pipes with holes in them just for aeration, first couple of days, then you pull them out. And what's really key to this system is that it's kept moist. Every day it receives some kind of moisture and it takes over a year to develop this. But because of this long-term uh, cellulosic environment that's not disturbed, it develops. What's very interesting is that it develops a greater amount of fungal to bacterial biomass. And it's rich with a great diversity of bacterial and fungal species that serve it. And then they can perform your ecosystem services. You can do, you can spread it bulk or you can make an extract out of it and you can treat seeds with it, for, for example. Now, this is what I call an ecosystem compost. This is not the first one that's been done out there. There's another guy, Mike, uh, Mark Sturgis up in Oregon, who actually does another kind of a ecosystem compost and is aiming for incredible microbial diversity with a lot of protozoa and nematode species. Another innovation, so we talked about alternative farming systems and different kinds of cover crops have been huge in sustainable agriculture um, in the USDA uh, Sustainable Ag Research and Education Program. A, a great amount of funds have gone into cover crop research, but this is fairly universal to all these alternative farming systems is a real emphasis on cover crops. There's a lot of choices to, uh, to go from. You have both cool season and warm season uh, cover crops like buckwheat and crimson clover. And then a lot of different ways to use cover crops. This is some of the systems we use on our farm. These are in plastic culture beds with living mulch between them. And if you establish this living mulch thickly, you'll have hardly any weeds. We can, have, we can see 95% weed control or more in, in these alleyways. What's really key to understanding a living mulch is you take the seeding rate that would normally be done for a forage. So an example in this instance, this is TEF, which is a warm season annual. Uh, it's real popular with hay, hay producers because they can establish it, produce a, a really fast growing forage crop and then bale it for hay. It's popular here in Kentucky because the horse farmers like it. What you do is you, this, this is, the seeding rate on this is 12 pounds per acre. For a living mulch, you triple that, okay? You really want a thick, really thick, aggressive living mulch. So now you put on 36 pounds per acre. This is how you get that. Um, we do these cover crop strips on the edge of field, sealed buckwheat, incredible um, attractor of beneficial insects, incredible weed suppression, great ability to extract phosphorus from the soil and make it available to the next crop. It really softens the soil, 
has an incredible effect on soil tilth. A lot of winter field cover crops. You plant spring oats in the fall, you get a lot of biomass production and then they winter kill. And then also under some cover crops. So a key concept here is that above ground complexity influences below ground soil food web complexity. And now there's this real emphasis on multi-species cover crops and different people around the country have been finding this out. Uh, well, David C. Johnson actually, that's like that should be a six way cover crop he's found. If you get six different cover crops mixed together, uh, Christine Jones in Australia is talking about 12 way, the Jenna field trials in Germany are talking about 16 way. But what people are saying is that when you get multi-species cover crops, you have better diversity above ground, you have a tipping point where these synergistic effects start taking place. You have better weed suppression, you, better have, you have better soil fertility, you have better pest control. And this is really popular now with no-till farmers in the Midwest and all over the country. People are doing 10-way, 20-way, 30-way cover crop mixes. Another innovation that has really been big is both compost teas and liquid compost extracts. And so um, the compost teas are more popular. Uh, however, in my experience, the liquid compost extracts are more uh, empowering at the broad scale level or at a farm level. Both of them start with a good quality, microbial diverse, microbial rich, substrate. It could be compost, vermicompost, a peat humus substrate, and both of them are trying to achieve agitation and dislodging this beneficial microbiology into solution. The difference is that compost teas are aerated further for 24 to 36 hours. They're also fed microbial foods like different carbon sources like molasses and humic acid and seaweed, and to uh, not only extract them but to proliferate the, the microbiology actually grow and extend the amount of bacteria and fungi that's in there. They're, they're very actively metabolizing and they have to be used quickly. They're, they're really popular with small scale uh, farmers and gardeners. With, with the extracts, no further aeration, no further add additives. You're after a, a shelf stable extract. They're, they're put in a tank they're tank blended with all these additives and then applied in the field. So what's important with the food safety regulations is whether your source is, for example, a manure-based compost or a veganic-based compost. So that's now becoming an issue. And this is what we're talking about when we say take a cup of, uh, say like a tablespoon of compost and put it in a Dixie cup and swish it around. Look at a microscope. That's what we're talking about. This is the bacteria. You can easily see those bacteria, fungi, protozoan nematodes, and that's what you'll see in compost teas and extracts. And that's what you're you're dislodging. That's what you're spraying out onto plant and root surfaces, so that they can then start performing their functions and their eco ecosystem services. In vast numbers of these too. So just a few examples. This is the GOT um, system. Uh, Bob Postema does this one. He sells the, the, um, the working parts, and then you provide your own tote. But here's the, here's the, um, the action, the agitation. What's interesting about this, let's see if there's one more. So what's interesting about this, this system can be used to make both a tea and an extract. So if you're going to do the tea, you bubble and aerate this for 24 to 36 hours if you're just going to, and you would feed it. And if you're going to do an extract, you would just dislodge it, just run it for 90 minutes, stop, that's it. And then you have a boatload, that's like a 250 gallon tote, right? So then you have a lot of material to work with. Another one, this is Sabino Cortez in Texas. This is a system he developed, which is the Erath compost. He makes large volumes of this. This is a hydrocyclone kind of a system, and you can do the same thing. You can make a tea, you can make an extract. Uh, and then Sabino was real, he was a real pioneer in organic farming in, in Texas. He just passed away a few months ago. 
And then this is the Aeromaster system, a couple of different examples. These are batch style. So you got a 250 gallon and a 500 gallon batch style. So you would load that up, you would make 250 gallons, you'd break it down, you'd have to load it up again. This is a system I worked with at Sustainable Growth Texas. This is the Chronic compost extractor. This was a guy named Dennis Chronic who designed and developed this. He has got a patent on it. You actually go to free patents online. You can read about this. This made uh, two gallon, 2,000 gallons per hour. We modified it. We were able to make continuous amount of 3,000 gallons of liquid compost extract per hour. And so there's a lot of hoses involved and you can fill up uh, 1,000 gallon tanks, 5,000 gallon tanks. You can take this to the field and, and do a lot of work with that. This is the kind of spray rig we're talking about. This is what Sustainable Growth did. Texas did, they did orchards, vineyards, landscapes, prairies, uh, pastures, et cetera. So the tank blend goes in here. So you got a really sophisticated tank blend. You have liquid compost extracts, humic acid, molasses, seaweed. Uh, you can, and you can tweak that for the plant system that you're trying to manage, the crop system you're trying to manage depending on the time of the year. But the point here are, is, is biosprayer technology. So this is a spray rig that's geared to conventional agriculture. And here are, are, is a backpack sprayer, a pump up backpack, backpack sprayer, and a, and a steel backpack mist blower. And all these are geared to standard pesticides. And yet the regenerative farmer grabs this technology and uses this microbial extraction technology to make up your biospray and apply it to the land. Then inoculate your root surfaces and leaf surfaces. So another innovation uh, has been what people call humified compost. This came out of the biodynamic experience from Aaron Fried Pfeiffer. And then uh, it was taken up by Siegfried and Uta Lubke in Austria. And they uh, have uh, developed this further and have taught this all over the world. They taught this in the United States. They, the first time, the first uh, uh, lectures they did actually was at Acres USA in 1989. And then they taught at Ecofarm in, at Asilomar in 1992. And then they did a series of four-day workshops in Pennsylvania and California in the mid-1990s. They taught this all over in Australia, et cetera. But, uh, and then and it's, this kind of goes on because the Chrome experience also is tied to this. But this is an example of a compost that you would find, for example, from a retail nursery center this is one I actually bought there in Austin, Texas. And what you can say about that is you can still see bark, you can still see stems from the parent material. And you know that's sold as a compost, it's pretty good, uh, but uh, there it's, it's just not completely transformed into humus. And it's also, it's just kind of non-structured, it's kind of fluffy. This would be like the humified compost that's made with Pfeiffer biodynamic compost or Lubke compost. This compost has been amended with uh, clayey soil. It's been microbial inoculated and it's turned into real humus. It's spongy and it also has an incredible amount of humic particles that's produced. So for example, if you made a compost tea or extract out of this one, you see a lot of bacteria and fungi in there, but you wouldn't see as many humus particles and you'll have a ton of them in here. So you're delivering all that out when you spray it out. The, another innovation has been EM, effective microorganisms. This is another thing that came out starting in the early 1990s. This was developed in Japan by Dr. Terio Higa. And basically EM is a microbial consortia of beneficial microorganisms that primarily consist of lactic acid bacteria, yeast, and phototrophic bacteria, but also often you'll see actinomycetes in there. Uh, and this is the diet, this is, the, this is really popular in Asian nature farming, is to describe how mechanisms work through um, basically, you know, illustrations and, and so forth. But you have organic matter, mycorrhizae, 
You have bioactive substances, amino acids, vitamins, and sugars, decomposition of matter, photosynthetic microorganisms such as photosynthetic bacteria, blue-green algae, nitrogen-fixing bacteria, lactic acid bacteria, antibiotic-producing bacteria such as actinomycetes, and then uh, yeast organisms that are producing bioactive substances and so forth. And then you have, this is all controlling pathogenic bacteria and it's helping the plant grow. And then we're going to run through a few of these different microbial cultures. So what's interesting is you take uh, EM mother culture and then blend it with different biomass resources on the farm. And you can make uh, fermented plant extract. You can make a foliar pest control by mixing it with alcohol and uh, different things. And you can have a fermented fish. You can make bokashi, fermented organic matter. You can make a uh, human uh, antioxidant drink. You can embed it into ceramics. A lot of different uses there. This is an example of an organic farm that we were on a, a humus management tour in Switzerland. And so these greenhouses have an incredible amount of salad mix production going on. They have the salad mix there. Normally, if you have food waste like that that are not treated, they'll go putrefactive and start rotting. So you have to mix that in, either into compost quickly or treat it with something like uh, lactic acid bacteria or with EM. So then that was treated with EM, kept in a fresh condition, and then it was incorporated. And this is Lupke compost. So here's the loopy compost piles. Here's the windrows with the compost turner and the fleece blankets. And so the fresh material from the EM food waste has gone into that. So it's a whole integrated system. This one is uh, Korean natural farming. And this one is based on indigenous microorganisms. And then based on creating these indigenous microorganisms, you can then do the same thing. You can take fermented plant juice, fermented fruit juice, fish amino acids, lactic acid, oriental herbal nutrients, which is a lot like EM5, and so forth. So this is what farmers are really interested in, is taking advantage of natural biomass resources, different uh, plant material, different herbal material, different uh, rock materials, sea minerals, fish, and using these microbial processes to and these microbial factories to produce these beneficial biofertilizers and different natural pest controls and plant tonics. And then the same thing in India. This, this system is over a thousand years old. It comes from the Vedas. And uh, so you'll see uh, very common in India, you'll have cow dung, cow urine, cow milk, ghee from, uh, from butter, and then different uh, recipes that make these different concoctions that again are used for both fertility and for pest control. And then this has traveled all over the world and so this is down in South America and these are microbial fermentation tanks and they're doing the same thing. They're taking advantage of these microbial bio fermentations and selling these and farmers are using them to boost up their crops, crop health. So this is basically what you're doing, as I described, you're taking a raw biomass source, you're taking microbes, you're adding some sugar and microbial foods to it, and then through various fermentation and extraction processes, you're, you're developing these bioavailable nutrients and bioactive substances, your enzymes, organic acids, hormones, and then a ton, a huge amount of beneficial microbes that you can apply out to plant and root surfaces and improve soil health and plant health. So then I think finally we'll, you know, we, we talked about different uh, alternative soil testing labs. And we went through some labs that do both Albrecht style mineral balancing and greens mineral balancing and so forth. But there's a whole series of labs that do the same thing that specialize in organic matter analysis humus analysis, and then various types of soil microbial analysis and soil health test analysis. So the, the let's see, the soil food web, there's both Earth Ford in Oregon, and then there's a soil food web lab in New York that's run by a different outfit. Uh, and then Woods Inn is one of the traditional labs up in New England. 
And then the Haney soil test is being offered by several labs now. And so Ward's lab uh, does the Haney test and they plus two, they, they do the uh, phospholipid fatty acid test. So farmers can uh, get a very good uh, grasp of their soils, their compost, their compost teas, compost extracts, and, and so forth with, um, with all of this, this technology. Uh, so there's a lot of options there. And a lot of this, again, has, was not available. <laughs> when, when all this started out in the early 70s, you know, very little of this was available. So all of this has evolved. Um, and over the last time, and it's getting better every every few years. So, all right, Dan, I think that's it. All right, great. Well, thank you for yes. an amazing overview. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, it was a little challenging there because I could have gone on there for for quite a while there, you know, talking talking about uh, many different systems. Well, it's interesting because, you know, oftentimes when you talk to people, they've heard about um, Korean natural farming, but they maybe haven't heard of um, EM or they've heard of the soil food web, but they haven't heard about um, Korean natural farming or indigenous microorganisms. So to frame these, all these concepts or isms or streams in the sort of biological perspective in relationship to each other, I think is very valuable. Um, you know, we all have our teachers and we all have our communities we come from, but to understand that they're all part of this broader ecosystem, um, I think is, is very helpful. I'm glad you were able to present that for people. Um, we'll yeah. got a few uh, questions here. You wanna just, I'll just jump yeah. into the Q&A? Sure. All right. Um, uh, Elul Wintermeyer, I have heard that the universities are by and large still operating in a chemical paradigm and have not recognized the role of bio, the role of biology as much. Do you believe this to be true? What are your thoughts about where academia currently is regarding recognizing the critical role of soil biology? Thank you. Okay, I would say if that it's really easy to see that universities have have broadened their horizons. Yeah, because all you have to do is open up journal articles and there's been an explosion of information on soil microbial ecology and the function of microorganisms. And so those are all coming from universities. And then uh, the the high quality electron microscopy images that I showed, those are coming from universities. So um, so, yeah, they there's and it's a mix bag when you when you you talk about a university you're talking about a very large organization and in agriculture um, you know it's the same way you have agronomy you have you know plant pathology entomology horticulture and you'll have a, a, a smorgasbord of different approaches amongst the different people who work there but I'd say at all probably almost every land grant university in the country now there are at least a half a dozen people who are involved in some form of soil health and soil and soil biology. Yeah, and that might have been half the case five years ago, and only a couple in the country ten years ago. I mean, oh, just, absolutely. Yeah, this has yeah. all evolved. And it, I'm to, you know, I mean, I if we just take like if we just go from 2021 to 1991, that is 30 years. So let's just talk about a 30 year time frame from the early 90s. All of this has evolved. Yeah. Yeah. From a Much less 50 years. Much less 50 years. But yeah. well, I'm bringing forth the you know, soil food dip stuff. I mean, the fact that fungi could be good was a, you know, <laughs> yeah. Oh, not to get oh. you tarred and feathered, but, right? I mean, in let the me tell you, and I, I have given, I give many workshops to, to different groups, including like master gardeners and, and, and you know, not only yeah. farmers, but. But to, in perspective, I was in college in the late 1970s, and the way that it was put forth then was that uh, pretty much all nematodes were, were were parasitic nematodes that that you know hinder and, and, and injure crop plants, and so therefore the solution is nematicides. So these are very strong chemicals, very toxic chemicals. So you know over time we we figured that out, and and the the whole concept of the soil food web is that the better the microbial density and diversity you have, the more robust and complex. The yeah. soil food web is you need you need no nematicides. You would never want to use those. 
the vast because majority. Because you want to you want to encourage crop rotations and li the living soil yeah. with the way that farmers can manage things, and so that's a given nowadays. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Allison says you guys make my week. Thank you, Allison. Uh, <laughs> um, Greg asks, uh, what are some good understory cover crops, um, and are there good perennial ground covers? When, when he says, can he, I don't know if he says understory. So, well, in that's two systems. One is an annual cropping system like vegetables and herbs and flowers, and another one would be tree crops. So, but yeah, you can definitely grow living mulches uh, in, 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 in compatibility with annual crops if you time those correctly. But uh, clovers, for example, would, would grow nicely underneath vegetables. Um, and then perennials, you know, there's just a lot of choices. A lot of this, let me, let me mention two things there. One, of, when these people ask questions, for example, on discussion groups, they often do not say where they live. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm always like, where do you live? <laughs> the geography makes such a big difference. If you're in New England, you know, your climate and your soils are one thing, but if you're in the Southwestern United States or in, in, the, in the deep South, everything's completely different. So, so where what we choose you makes there, a difference. Where's a resource for people to begin to tease out in their bioregion or their time of year, what would be most appropriate? Yeah, the, 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 the USDA SARI program, Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Pro, Program has done an excellent job on compiling resources on cover crops. Like I said, when, when the USDA started funding sustainable ag research in the, in the 1990s, in the early 1990s, that was when cover crops exploded. They, they, and the, there's just an incredible amount of information on cover crops now. But do you know, and I was, I was in agriculture working at this time, and do you know one of my publications is on cover crops and green manures, but at that time there was very little. What I was doing was going to the library and looking up old USDA bulletin from the 1930s and 40s to find out how cover crops worked. Yeah. yeah. So that's really widely available. The seed companies are also a good source. Yeah. Um, okay, great. Uh, Jorvin says, if you manage soil biology well through inoculants, photosynthesizing plants in the ground at all times, et cetera, to what degree is it still necessary to manage soil chemistry through mineral amendments? The, okay, this is a great question. Because this, this one is bound to come up. And so a, a few things should be said there. And the first one is that is why I included the slide about remarkable paradigm shifting results are coming out of the soil health movement. And it's been it's driven by innovations and in our understanding of soil biology and the complexity of soil biology and taking advantage of these microbial influenced farming systems. Uh, so the, the other part of that, and then there's also this, um, there's this sort of saying that, uh, that a lot of the, let's say permaculture students and soil food web students have grasped onto, and that is that if you have the right soil biology, you can make any mineral available on any soil in the world. And that one we should be cautious about and, and not get too crazy. Um, that's popular with that's popular with gardeners. I don't say see very many farmers going along with that, and it just goes back to what I just said. If you take one single state and you drive around to different regions of the state, you'll encounter many different kinds of soils and uh, and farms. And some of these soils are very good and very fertile, and some of them are very very low fertility, very challenging. So you cannot say one size fits all and, and make that work. The third thing we should say about that is that we are talking about the integration of minerals, biology, and energy. And all of the eco-agriculture experience has shown that it all works better and you achieve better results. You have better insect and disease control and nutritious crops, et cetera, when you pay attention to both soil minerals and soil biology. That's for sure. But biology has, has, has totally expanded our concept. And I will say that I have seen soil test reports where you look at the, say, for example, the calcium magnesium ratio and the other numbers on a, on a regular soil test, they all improve the more you improve soil health and soil biology. They just naturally start coming together better. 
the but you cannot, you cannot get away from the fact if you don't have copper and zinc in your soil at a sufficient amount, you're not, that's not going to change. <laughs> yeah. No boron means. <laughs> yeah. It's not, it is not too difficult to do all this. You know, yeah. it's just that people have to free their minds, look at the tools, why we're talking about this. The reason, the whole reason we're talking about that is that eco farming has been spectacularly successful over the last 50 years. And if you look at all those different teachers and consultants, that is a that's a that is like A to Z alphabet of the best consultants in the country. You're biased. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, Nicholas has a, a, a bit of a long question, but potentially we'll see where you, where, where you go with it. Um, these slides are very clear and helpful for understanding. Great visuals. Thank you. I have a virus question and apologize if it's too controversial. Viruses seem extremely small as shown in one of your slides. As far as an indoor organic garden setting, I'd assume viruses that cause harm in a more clean disinfected environment would be naturally much less harmful in a garden or to a human in a more biologically active environment. And due to their size, they'd move freely through a HEPA filter or a mask, question mark. You wanna take yes, any- Well, the, the, the virus thing is, they're even tinier than the bacteria yeah we saw there but what i just the way to summarize that is is this that um the food safety standards that the fda is trying to that they are they're 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 evaluating fruit and vegetable growing operations against tend to view microbes skeptically because they're concerned about uh, microbial foodborne illnesses that arrive from E. coli and salmonella and, and so forth. But what's important is that the greater the diversity and number of microorganisms that you have, the better ability you have to offset all of these problems. So you're gonna have better, you're gonna have healthier plants, healthier people, and, and that's from the microbial density and diversity that you're trying to encourage. And so that is the same for viruses, in my opinion. I mean, I at least I, at least I, let's say I, I think so. <laughs> yeah. The pattern of life would suggest that's likely the case. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, you talk about examples of, you know, a, a cabbage and then the bird flying over poops on it. And theoretically you've got E. coli on the cabbage, but, um, Lo and behold, all of the uh, all the microbes on the surface of the cabbage basically kill the E. coli, right? So I mean, that's what that's the way it, the way it goes down is ninety eight percent of the microbes are are symbiotes and two percent are pathogens or whatever. And when you've got that healthy ecosystem, that microbiome on the leaf surface or on the root surface or in your gut or wherever it is, that the the symbiotic microbes literally are the first line of defense in addressing the pathogens. That's how I understand it. Yes, yes, and and just remember the slide on. Um... The biocontrol mechanism with the petri dishes that is called competitive exclusion yeah and that's the same concept you you have a great diversity and number of beneficial microorganisms that offset the population of harmful ones and uh, what they say was the the terrain makes the difference yeah right terrain terrain T -E -R -R -A -I -N. the terrain yes not the terrain <laughs> <laughs> biological terrain yes yes was it who was it uh uh Beauchamp. Beauchamp, Antoine Beauchamp. Yeah. Yes, who people don't know much about, uh, but some, some do. All right, we've got two questions here about the Johnson Sioux bioreactor. Um, I'll just read them both. From Jorvan again, uh, does it matter what mix of materials you make the Johnson Sioux compost with for a good result? It seems that people use more carbon-rich material for it than a usual compost. What would you recommend? That's one. And Rob asks, um, Johnson Sioux bioreactor is out of reach for many in the Northeast, as Johnson says it must not freeze. Can I achieve the same effect by leaving the pile longer, say for two years instead of one? Yeah, those are both good, two good questions. So, I, and, I, and I, that is true that you'll see that uh, the ingredients that people are using with the Johnson Sioux bioreactor are really heavy on carbon. Uh, it's, the recipes actually are different in the way people normally think of the carbon to nitrogen ratio for say thermophilic compost where you're trying to heat up. You would tend to have more uh, animal manure and food waste that are more nitrogen rich in a regular, you know, you know, heat making compost. But these are slow uh, composts that uh, are done over a very long period of time, 
and they just naturally, you know, with enough moisture and enough, you know, of this activity, this microbial activity, they, they eventually transform. Now, now I will say that I've gotten samples of the Johnson Sioux, and it doesn't look like regular compost. Um, it's still, it's not humified. Okay, so this is a different kind of a compost. Um, and then the second question was, could you do that longer in the Northeast? Yes, possibly. Although I just heard a seminar from, from David C. Johnson and his wife, and they were saying, yeah, the moisture is really, really important. Um, I'm actually thinking of building a little uh, high tunnel to maintain a couple uh, you know, pallets and keep those going. Well, so the question was about freezing. Is it, if it freezes, does that, is that somehow detrimental? I mean, I don't know why it would be. Yeah, I, I don't know. I think, I don't think you can get away from it unless you, like I said, unless you build something for it. So I think you just have to go with what you have. Um, now, let me just point out two things. One is that, remember I said that, that it's kind of like an ecosystem compost and that is, Johnson right. Sioux is not the only kind of ecosystem compost out there. So uh, check out Mark Sturgis in Oregon and how he does his ecosystem compost. And then also in New England, there's a place called Compost Works that I have purchased some ecosystem compost before. And uh, it's really rich in diversity of stuff. And then the other thing I wanna say is that I have really some really substantial experience with making um, liquid compost extracts on a large volume applied to broad scale acres, like lots and lots of volume of this material that's taken out and sprayed in. What we always aimed for was not one kind of compost. We always tried to take tried to keep three or four different compost on hand that we would blend to make the extract. And the whole purpose there was we want, we want different diversity. You know, you know, we would have a vermicompost, we'd have an ecosystem compost, we'd have a thermophilic compost, and we would blend them. And we're getting benefits from all three. And I mean, just to make the point about sort of the Johnson Sioux, but the ecosystem composts in general, these are more inoculants than they are, you know, fertility supplements. I think, you know, I, I mean, I'm not sure. I think, as I understand, three pounds per acre of Johnson Sioux is, you know, it's effectively providing no nitrogen or potassium or phosphorus. What it's providing is billions and quadrillions of microbes. That is and, correct. With, with incredible diversity yeah. and incredible amount of ecosystem services. So yeah. it's an inoculant. It's it an inoculant. Is, it, yeah, yeah. You're, you, um, you know, this, this changes the paradigm because we normally, in, in kind of the older, older way of thinking of compost, and, and we still do this in, in organic farming, we're aiming for like, say, 10 tons per acre, which is like 15 cubic yards, or 20 tons per acre, something like that, of bulk applied compost. Um, but, you know, that's, that's, we're talking high end, in my example, my, in my thinking, I'm, I'm managing a high end vegetable production that has, a, you know, it's market driven. But let's say you're doing pastures, you know, you've got, you know, got hundreds of pastures. Um, you, you're managing large tracts of land. That's not possible. So you, you shift your thinking to a high quality compost substrate that you can make a compost extract out of and then spray out there. So you're using a small volume of compost. You could just even, you can even buy some, you could buy a cubic a few cubic feet or just one cubic yard of material and have it shipped over. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So um, Erica asks, is um, the alternative soil testing list available uh, somewhere? Yeah, that's on the ATRA website, ATRA, A-T-T-R-A dot org. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure it's as up to date as, as mine was, but that's where it came from. Yeah. Alternative technology transfer for rural America. Uh, it's, well, they, they just call it ATRA, Sustainable Agriculture Information Center. Yeah. Okay. It used to be. It used to yeah, have. Yeah, a... yeah, it used to be appropriate technology transfer for rural areas. Yeah. Uh, but that is that's the that is managed by the by it isn't it's part of a nonprofit organization called National Center for Appropriate Technologies. Yeah. And they they um, realize that sustainable agriculture is an important part of empowering communities and sustainable communities. So they, they provide that service. One of the sponsors of this conference. And okay, yeah. Yeah. It's a uh, really good group. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, uh, Lenore, do you know of any initiatives slash research slash info on using processes similar to building soil microbial health, i.e. the compost extracts EM for healing human microbiome health, digestion, immunity, oh. et cetera, or what resources I can consult from experts drawing those parallels? It's very closely uh, related, and 
so uh, just the one of them that we, we described there was the EM or effective microorganism system. And that was, if you mentioned, if you, if you saw that slide, I, it has a EMX, which is a human uh, microbial antioxidant drink for human health. It influences the gut flora and it has, has already extracted these antioxidant properties out which are real health giving. They're, they they fight free radicals and which you know are part of the degenerative disease process. And so that's one of them. There's a there's a really good uh, EM based uh, uh, you know uh, drink for uh, my, for gut flora called Vitabiosa. And Vi Vitabiosa was developed by this Danish guy. He, I think they're in Canada. And he blends herbs and uh, berries in there and makes this drink. It's very, very rich and flavorful. Now, if you take, and this, this is just a couple examples. If you go to a health food store, you'll see all kinds of stuff on there in the, with, uh, for you know, microbial gut flora. Lactobacillus, all these different things. And right. you, know, you can take these home and look under the microscope, you'll see them. You'll, you can see a lot of diversity of microorganisms in there. I mean, at least a, num a huge number of these, of these bacterial species in there. Her question was about you know, how we can, at least the way I read it, was um, work with our local microbiomes to make inoculants for not just our gardens, but for ourselves. And my response would be, that's what you know, kimchi and sauerkraut and pickles, et cetera, et cetera are right, is you're basically taking the microbiome of the plants that are on your fields and you're fermenting them and then, and then establishing them in your gut flora. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, and there you go. Yeah. Sourdough, sourdough bread is basically, is going to be pulling right. you know, the, the unique microbes in your, in your, you know, dynamic in your home, right. in your garden or wherever it is, is, is what's going to be causing that, 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 that flower to rise in that way. Um, That's right. And, and then let me, let me add one more thing there. There was, a, there was a paper that was actually, it was conducted on our research form at the University of Kentucky and uh, the professors in this, in the grad students, what they did is they, they, we have both organic research plots and conventional research plots on the same form. And so what they did is they grew these vegetable crops in a paired study. And then they took the, the plants and they sampled them and they, they were able to do this isolation when they looked at the microorganisms that are on the conventional versus organic. And not only do these microorganisms live on the surfaces like the root, the root sphere and the plant, the leaf sphere, they live inside the plant. Yeah. And they actually showed that there were a greater number of these microorganisms and a greater diversity of these microorganisms on the organic treated plots. So that has an influence on microbiome health. Which would affect if you're gonna use that cabbage to make sauerkraut with or those yeah. cucumbers to make pickles with. Right lactofermented kind of way, you would get a much broader diversity of those microbes into your body. Yes. Right. Yeah. Right. And then, and then, uh, you know, you can make these extracts, you could do some of the Korean natural farming recipes you could make, uh, you could do, you know, your own um, extract for consumption, you know, something like that. Like herbal, uh, oriental herbal nutrients. Yes. Like, like a little tonic. I mean, if you take a, t if you take uh, ginger, for example, or, or turmeric, these are very strong herbs and you, you make a, you can make an extract out of those and, and drink them. So, yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, Bill and Jay asked, how do compost tea and extract compare and which are better for veggies, shrubs and berries, fruit and nut trees? Yeah, the, the, the difference there was the teas are very, they're popular. They're, they're with the smaller style of um, equipment that's available. Uh, and then they're very active and they're, they're very helpful. Uh, so, and then the extracts are kind of geared to more broad scale, but people are kind of waking up to extracts even on a small scale now. And the difference there is that the, on the plant succession, there's sort of this, this, this range of sort of bacterial dominated and fungal dominated. And all I can say is that in almost every <laughs> agricultural situation, you want more fungal. It's really hard to get that. So basically what you do is you feed them with more fungal foods. 
So instead of using molasses, which is a simple sugar and it would feed more bacterial, you would feed them with something like you know seaweed or humic acid, uh, chitin from crab shell meal, that kind of thing. And that would be either for an extract or a tea. Yeah. And what is the technical yeah. difference just for those who are well, maybe didn't quite the difference is in the tea, you put everything in the tank and you you aerate it for a long period of time and, and you have this rich microbial soup. The extract, you, you pull out the, dislodge the, uh, the microbiology into solution and let it sit there. You put it in the tank. And when you go to the field, you then you add all the microbial foods and you agitate it quickly and spray it out in the field. Yeah, so one's more active and one's more dormant, but it becomes more active once you spray it into the field. Interesting. Yeah. Um, Another one on this topic, Rob asks, how important are recipes and dilution rates in compost extracts and fermented plant extracts? Is it possible to overdo it? it there's, there's some recipes out there. Um, actually, the, I would say that on a, on a professional level, the, 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 the know-how becomes the key way to make all this work better. Uh, but I think there's enough guidelines out there that this, the standard recipes uh, and just trying it out will be helpful. I will, I will say that um, one thing I was not able to include, and this might be helpful to understand, was in, in biological control mechanisms, there's a thing called general suppression and specific suppression. And compost teas and extracts would fall under the general suppression because what you're doing is you have a lot of microbial diversity in the compost that you are extracting out and applying out, but you don't know who they are. You know there's a lot of them there, you know they have different functions, but you don't know who they are. That's a general approach. The specific suppression be more of your, your specific identified microbial cultures like the EM and these different other uh, commercially available microbial inoculants. And there are probably over at least four dozen microbial inoculants on the market. These have more specific isolated microorganisms that are really, that have known uh, tasks that they perform biological control or they do phosphorus solubilization. And that's why those microbial inoculants that you can get are very helpful. Yeah. I don't think we answered Rob's question though exactly. He said, you know, how important are, is basically I, what I'm hearing or reading is dilution rates. So if it's- Oh, dilution rates. If it's- you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not big on, people, basically. people say dilution, and you hear that, like if you've got a 25 gallon tank, you just put like two, one gallon in there and all that stuff. I know that's big with Johnson Sue, but when we did um, broad scale liquid compost extracts, you've got a 500 gallon tank, 490 gallons was compost extract and the other 10 gallons was the additives. It's straight compost extract. Yeah. So you don't have any, any concerns with uh, overdoing it? Per no. Se. No, no. <laughs> that's that's good. I guess that's the answer. <laughs> um, I, one question I've got, or uh, you know, it's one that's come up to me when I've been speaking is when we're talking about compost tea extracts, etc., um, versus IMOs and harvesting from the ecosystem, and then there's the um, the soil microbiome and you know the the rhizosphere, and then there's the phyloplane. If you're going to be harvesting the leaves of a plant to make a, uh, a, a tea, uh, you know, an inoculant with for leaves for, you know, for the above ground part of the plant is, I mean, is there a difference there? If you're, if you're taking microbes that are from soil and putting them on a leaf surface is to stimulate the appropriate microbiology, is that in some fashion a flawed logic? That actually, I've heard this discussion before, and there may be that may be uh, something that we should do over a barley seminar or something like that. Barley. <laughs> <laughs> you know, at the end of the day of the end of the conference, uh, we should you know yeah. we should lift a few pints and discuss that. But uh, uh, so yeah, the yeah, I don't have I have a I don't have a one hundred percent answer on that. Yeah, yeah, but. Um, the, the, the one thing I should mention is that compost teas have their place uh, and there's also some caution around them. They are, you know, if you're doing food crops and you're doing commercial production and you're selling into the public, because FDA is monitoring and regulating food safety now, 
you should not be, I don't think you should be using compost teas in a, in a crop production cycle if you're doing say like greens or something like that you're gonna harvest. Now the, the qualifier there is that are you using animal-based man manure compost or a veganic style compost? That's a qualifying difference. But uh, you should just be aware of that. This is basically FISMA stuff you're talking about. Yeah, yeah really. Food Safety Modernization Act. Yeah. I've always said I don't believe in fighting anything, but FISMA, I might make a special case for. <laughs> yeah. uh, anyway, okay, Lenora says, your slides are great. Thank you for sharing this comprehensive overview coming out of your well-integrated knowledge. Um, okay, um, Elul has another question. Have you seen successful municipal composting programs that produce a biologically rich input that's beneficial to soils? States and cities seem to see the need to compost as a waste management strategy only and not as a way to inoculate soils with microbes. Obviously all food scraps should become beneficial compost. Do you know of municipalities who do this? Uh, I didn't catch the first part of the question there. She's asking about uh, the food waste and compost. Are there any municipal composting systems that you're aware of that do a good job making compost or? Yeah, let me, let me uh, point out that we, we, one of the systems I mentioned in, in passing and I and have a whole set of slides I can explain the whole thing is what's called Lubke compost or humidified compost. And this came out of Aaron Fried Pfeiffer's experience and, and he was a, a biodynamic researcher and scientist who developed microbial controlled composting. He developed bacterial cultures to drive the composting process. He helped the city of Oakland do this in their municipal composting program. And so, you know, that was the, he, he lived, you know, from the 1920s until the 1950s and, and passed away. But in the, the Lubke family in Austria, you know, started examining all this. They went all over the world and studied humus um, systems and they adopted this compost system and, and evolved it. And that's why a lot of these compost turners that you see nowadays, a lot of these compost fleece blankets, microbial inoculation of compost came out of the Lubke experience. It's been very influential in, in composting in the United States. And so uh, Edwin Blosser with Midwest Biosystems, George Leidig with Autrusa Compost Systems, they both taught seminars on this. And so the point is, is that a number of uh, municipal composting operations have adopted this. And so they do co-composting and they, they have some kind of a waste stream, like maybe biosolids, and they have municipal yard waste. So they put those together, they have compost windrows, maybe they take food waste and they make compost. So yeah, there's, there's compost facilities that just do municipal compost. And then they take food waste, they blend them all together in a windrow. They have the ability to, to manage that very well because they have compost turners, they have uh, temperature probes, oxygen probes, they have moisture, they can manage the piles very nice. They can make a good quality compost and then they sell it to, to local gardeners and landscapers. So some some do. Are you aware of specific municipalities? I mean, you said Oakland, but I, I mean. Well, no, they're, they're, they're scattered all over the country. I've, I've met a number of them. Um, um, yeah, I'd have to put, put together a list, but yeah, you, you can just look up, um, uh, you know, Aeromaster compost systems and follow backwards what they're doing with, with, with municipalities. Cool. I mean, and just one point about the Lubkeys, I've heard it said I mean, that they were in Austria and um, the compost makers and, and microbiologists and farmers. And uh, what I understand is that after Chernobyl happened, their, um, the area surrounding them was had, you know, radioactive fallout and the Austrian government came around and they tested the crops of the farms um, and said if they found, you know, if they found radiation on your cabbage or in your milk, you couldn't sell it. And all around the Lubkeys, they found radiation in people's crops, but on their farm, they didn't. Is that is that apocryphal? That is true. That is true. There's there's been several articles published on that, and I know the Lubkeys personally. I was over there in, in you know in Austria. So, uh, but yeah, that cesium one thirty seven, and it was uh, the fallout from Chernobyl is landing like you know kind of radioactive dust, and the crops you know, the forage that the cows were eating, et cetera, were taking it up and they had to dispose of it. But the Lukies, um tested theirs and they showed that because of this competitive exclusion, because of this rich living soil that they were, they were encouraging because of their whole system, they, their crops were okay, they were able to sell them. Because, now, the, because the microbiology was functioning so well yes. on the leaf surface, the cesium was effectively digested into some 
non-radioactive element. Either that or it was not taken up because it was competitively excluded by the, uh, li by the living soil. And by the way, I, I, you hear me talk about humus management. And what's, what's, uh, what's unique here is that in the United States, we talk about organic matter management. In, but in Europe, in out of the loop experience, they always talk about humus management. And what this is all tied into this whole theme that we're talking about today with biology and, and building the soil health is that humus management is a whole series of things. It's making good quality compost, but it's also using cover crops, multi-species cover crops. Some people will do reduced tillage or no-till. Other people will use spading machines and they'll bio-inoculate the green cover crop residue and then spade it into the soil and they'll still build humus. Yeah. But the point is, is that if you're trying to take raw organic matter like fresh green cover crop residue and transform that into stable humus that is also nutritive and builds the soil life and, and so forth. So there's a whole system around humus management being the objective, not claiming to be no-till or claiming to be biodynamic or claiming to be this as the, ob correct. the objective is to is to facilitate that humus development. And so strategic use of tillage is entirely appropriate if you understand what you're doing as and when. That is that is correct. And that is so important to understand. Yeah. And and so there's many tools and, and things around this, but we're all of these alternative farming systems have a way of aiming for better humus, better food quality, and, and better pest suppression through these practices. Yeah. Right. Uh, just a quick comment here from Nicholas. Um, excellent book uh, that shows how to make a lot of these ferments, Regenerative Grower's Guide to Garden Amendments uh, by Nigel Palmer. Yeah, yeah just that's good. This past year, I believe. Um, that's a great link there for people who are interested. Um, we've got one minute left. Um, what final comments would you like to leave us with this time, Steve? <laughs> well, so we, this one, this was a really great topic to get into. And as you can see, we just had a little snapshot. Um, so, um, I think that the experience that we've gone through with understanding minerals and mineral balancing and understanding biology and humus management are real central to all of these alternative farming systems, especially in the eco-agriculture theme. And then, so the next time we get together, we're gonna to talk about energy. And so I'm gonna really go into alternative agriculture. We're gonna really expand the horizon. You broke up, you so, broke up right before you had the, the, the punchline there, we lost it. Um, we, you said you've done, the, you've done the foundational pieces of, of minerals and biology. And then- Oh yeah, so on energy, we're really gonna talk about alternative agriculture. Yeah. We're really going to expand the boundary. Beautiful. Well, I'm looking forward to it. Farmers want to know. <laughs> People do like to talk about that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you very much. Looks like a bunch of uh, a very much appreciations in the chat coming in for you. So uh, thanks for hosting, Dan. We'll see you next time. See you next time. Yeah. Great.